the cloud. So great. Um, again, my name is Zach Sargas. I'll be your host. Um, we're joined by Elise Bergio, Jason Klimek, and soon to be Mary Kruger. This is part seven of the New York Cannabis Legalization Workshop. And we're looking at article four of the MRTA, the second portion uh, for adult use cannabis. I want to give a big shout out to our founding sponsoring member, Harris Beach. Uh, they've been with us since the onset and their investment and, and support has truly just kept the kept the Zoom calls rolling. So thank you so much. Um, also big shout out to our 2021 sponsoring members, Mad Hatter's Hideaway Smoke Shop and the uh, Wagoner firm PLLC. Um, again, these contributions have been are so substantial and we're, we are so grateful for your support and look forward to continuing to work with you all for the remainder of this year. Um, we have a bunch of founding business members. Big shout out to all the folks who've been with us since the beginning and also our new business members, uh, EFPR group, CBRE, Beacon Skiff and Hellendale. Um, so without further ado, I'll let my uh, co-presenters just do a quick introduction of themselves and you know what they're looking forward to talking about today and as I'm taking care of the back end. So Elise, take it away. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elise Bergio. I am a uh, member of Barclay Damon. I'm special counsel here. I also lead our cannabis service team and I chair the New York State Bar Association's Cannabis Committee. Um, and I'm um, stoked to be here. We're gonna have a, a good sesh. Cool. I'm Jason Klemek. I'm a member of Woodsovia uh, Cannabis Practice, as well as a member of the New York State Bar Cannabis Law Committee. Um, very interested on about today's topic. One thing that I hope that we get to discuss that I have heard creeping up and I've been racking my brain about is people trying to get interests somehow in multiple licenses um, that otherwise are prohibited. Um, and so I, hopefully, you know, we get to a little discussion about that because I know there's some very uh, interested people on that topic and uh, the law is written quite expansively, so. Hmm. You wanna extend on that just a little bit, Jason? Sure. So let me, I have a copy right here. Let me bring up the exact language I'm talking about. Um, have you had multiple people ask this? Oh I mean, yeah. People, but I don't even, I've just been like, yeah, that's not happening. That's, I mean, that has been my answer, but yeah. apparently people are thinking that they've come up with workarounds and I'm like, then you know something I don't. Um, what are the workarounds? So one is potentially having some type of like real estate interest. That's uh, indirect, you're not allowed to. That's my point is in the, the word indirect could be read so expansively that like I was discussing this with a colleague and absent regulations narrowing the scope. If you were invested as just a normal investor in a mutual fund that owned a share of a publicly traded cannabis company that held a New York cultivation license, well, indirect. you would be prohibited from holding both a dispensary and another cultivation license. Like that's how broad I could read that. The other thing, which I think is important to note on that is like if, and I do think this is going to be lobbied to death. I, I'm telling you right now, in, the indirect interest is going to be the largest lobbying component of this legislation by a mile. And I think people should hire, you know, if you're going to hire a lobbyist, that's what you hire them for, right? You hire lobbyists because you have a single issue or multiple issues about the legislation that you want changed that is when you put up the big bucks, right? And try to get that point lobbied across because a lot of stuff happens with that, right? Like hemp flower was super lobbied. And then, you know, it might not be the exact thing that everybody wanted, but you did get hemp flower. It just has to be sold through dispensaries now. So, you know, and same with like hemp and, uh, and, and beverages and food that was taken out and then put back in. And that's only because of super big lobbying efforts for those specific points. If you want indirect interest to be defined specifically, pony those bucks up. That's all I guess. Mm -hmm. I completely right? agree. I just don't know how you could come up with any arrangement where somehow you get some sort of financial benefit, or even if you didn't, but you could, that doesn't fall within indirect or direct financial interest. I just, my brain has not come up with a single thing and neither has anybody I've really talked to. 
I also think too, if they like are super, like let's just put this into perspective. Say they screw up and they're a little too ambiguous on something and people find this little workaround loophole, similar to what I consider Delta eight is kind of a workaround loophole. It gets crushed. You might enjoy it for a moment of brief, you know, periods of time, but it gets crushed eventually. So like structure it the right way. And then hopefully down the line, they change vertical integration. And they say, Hey, you can buy retail stores now after three, you got to think about the mission of the bill. P you know, the, the majority leader and Senator Kruger, the mission of the bill is to get so many people into the space in the original round. And they've all come out and said, Hey, we anticipate everyone getting bought up, right? Like everyone is going to get, we, we anticipate that there's not, there's going to be half the operators in three to five years because these big companies are going to come in. In order to do that, they're going to have to let those big operators probably buy vertically. You know, if you're going to have a smaller amount, I mean, they're not going to just buy probably just a producer processor. They can't have a conglomerate unless they, they remove those restrictions. So if you think about this in five years, you probably will be able to have a retail store to purchase. But, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I think anybody trying to be disingenuous in this application, there's going to be so many people applying, you're, you're going to be in a whirlwind thinking you're going to get those workarounds. I don't know. That's my opinion, but. The consequences for violating it are pretty severe. I mean, they can mm -hmm. revoke your license. They can ban you from obtaining a license in the future for X number of years. So it's not something where you want to take kind of a aggressive position and be wrong. You know, from a lawyer's standpoint, we can always say to the client, look, we don't recommend this. This is why if the client goes forward, then that's their, their prerogative. But, you know, there, there definitely needs to be the awareness that the, the consequences can be quite severe and, and shut you out of the industry for, you know, a time period. So, yeah. I also I think, think you might be able to apply as an RO. They might open that up a little bit. They're going to probably have to in order to sustain the medical program. They will have yeah. to expand it. Um, I was with somebody on Friday about that. So, I mean, if that's something you really want, if you do really want to, if vertical integration is the number one priority in your business model, then I would look towards an RO application as opposed to getting in the adult use space. It would be interesting too, to see like, you know, if, if they open up the ROs before they revise the vertical integration part of the law, that if they would open up the fully vertically integrated adult use licenses to a new RO, is that a, I know I've thought about that into the the fully vertically integrated side. So there are a lot well, of you think about that with uh, what's that court case that's happening right now? I just talked about it. Something health. I always forget the first word. Which their harvest the, health or it's is it a know. New York case? Yeah, it's it's in the appeals right now. It's actually Jeff Schultz's firm is it's Matt Schweber is appealing it. Oh, I don't know. And it's uh, what is the company? Oh, I'm gonna this is gonna tick me off, but. They're, they were 11th or 12th on the RO. Oh, Remember we're talking yeah. about this. They're 11th or 12th. And then they, you know, the first five, four of them resold it and they were mad. They're like, no, we should have been, you know, write a first refusal on that. Mm -hmm. And those are people who, depending on what ha happens with that court case, is, is going to dictate what happens, I think, for RO purposes of expansion. Or they might just say and settle the case and be like, yeah, you guys can be awarded an RO now. And you know, everybody in the audience, like we're talking about this, this is all the stuff that we as lawyers are, and, you know, participants in the industry are trying to figure out because even now with the medical program and things like that, there's still so many unknowns and we don't even have regulations for the adult use yet. So like this, everything we're saying is just, you know, we think that it's this, but mm -hmm. sure. it's the, the answers are so few. I mean, you know, one of the biggest things is what can we do, but, you know, to plan, well, there's some limited things, you know, check out some municipalities, have some conversations with town boards, things like that. But beyond that, it's just so hard to plan because the regulations could change one little thing. And suddenly what you were thinking is either not allowed or completely different somehow. So yeah, it's just, it's very difficult. Truly. Well, let's bring this up and, and see exactly how it's going to break down. I know, again, as you're saying, Jason, it's, uh, the this is what we're looking at is the law and we're all going to be waiting on the regulations the regulations is the fine print but the law does outline the framework that we're going to be working with 
I um, just want to welcome Mary Kruger of Rock Normal. Uh, she is on. Good morning, Mary. Welcome. Or good afternoon, good, I should say. Good afternoon, Zach. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, yeah, so we're picking up on this uh, on page 38. And so we're just beginning to look at uh, what the application process looks like. And we've, we've covered a bunch of like the background check information and the data that they'll want to co collect the process of application. Um, and we'll just jump in from here. So another important thing that is going to be considered, of course, is uh, good moral character. So uh, this next section, H, the applicant and its managing officers of, are of good moral character and do not have an ownership or controlling interest in more um, in more license or permits than allowed by this chapter or any regulations promulgated here um, here under. So as we begin to look at the actual license breakdown, it'll let you know how many licenses you can have or locations you can have, but it's it, it's pretty dang clear uh, back to that conflict of interest we opened this dialogue up with that it, it's it's not a free for all. Um, so I, uh, the applicant has entered into a labor peace agreement with a bona fide labor organization that is actively engaged in representing or attempting to represent the applicant's employees, et cetera. Um, uh, J, the applicant will contribute to communities of people disproportionately harmed by enforcement of cannabis laws through, through including but not limited to the social responsibility framework as provided in section 66 of this article and report think, uh, these contributions to the board. I think that's an interesting one because I can't remember if it was, I think it might be later um, where, or before, I can't, in any case, there's a part that says, you know, if you're not a social equity applicant, you have to come up with a social equity plan as part of your license. Like that. However, that J sub paragraph J there kind of seems to indicate that regardless of who you are, just an applicant will contribute to communities and disproportionately uh, and people disproportionately. So even if you're not explicitly told you need a plan, it does seem that you still have to kind of come up with a plan. And that's why like, I've been telling all my clients, regardless of whether they are social equity or otherwise, come up with this plan, because I think it's a big enough and important enough part of the law that you should do it regardless of whether there's an explicit requirement or not. Totally. And I, I think it's, it's just so fascinating. And I, I'm really interested to see what the actual regs say to this, like how detailed, on what degree, what considers you know, what's considered uh, a contribution? Is it financial? Is it, you know, a combination of volunteering, et cetera? Um, yeah, and, and then again, report these contributions to the board. So is there going to be a, a is it gonna be article uh, or like, you know, form K-17, that is the, uh, you know, the contribution to communities and people disproportionately harmed by enforcement of cannabis laws. Like, is, are we gonna have to fill that out? Is it something that's gonna be part of a, like curious just what the reporting process is gonna look like? Is it form based? Is it, you know, something that needs to be prepped in more paragraph form? Um, we will see. You know what else I think super interesting is, um, and I've had clients ask me this a lot, right? Like, so if you're a white male and you're not gonna do this whole pretend to be social equity through your wife or through a business partner component, right? Like you're just owning the fact that you're not social equity. Um, what's most important, right? Like is the most important thing to pump your application to be in a zip code that's disproportionately impacted by the prohibition? Is it to have a facility that runs off, off the grid energy for production and processing um, and has, you know, reusable water? Is it you know, that and a culmination of both. So, you know, it's interesting because this bill, I think was so progressive on the social equity components that it's missing a lot of the stuff that other states have used to dictate an application, which is the energy, waste, security, water, all that stuff that's important and just like the everyday operations sticks that um, is something that we're, you don't want to forget about, right? We can be talking about social equity, but there's, the operations of day-to-day -day stuff is also very important. How are you finding your employees? How many employees do you anticipate? You know, is that where you can pull that social equity component in? That's sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, that leads us to K. Okay, if the application is for an adult use cultivator processor license, the environmental and energy impact, including compliance with energy standards of the facility to be licensed. So they're obviously going to be paying acute attention to that. 
But um, yeah, you could easily glaze over and maybe not prioritize that explanation in your application that could come back to bite you. Um, but again, we'll see what the regs lay out. Um, L, the applicant satisfies any other conditions determined by the board and M, if it's an RO or a registered organization, which is the medical, the vertically integrated medical pro, uh, companies, the organization's maintenance or, of effort in manufacturing or dispensing and or research of medical cannabis for certified patients or caregivers. Two, the board is not satisfied that, if the board is not satisfied that the application should be issued a license, if the applicant should be issued, the executive director shall notify the applicant in writing of a specific reason or reasons recommended by the board for denial. Um, the three, the state cannabis advisory board shall have the authority to recommend to the board the number of licenses issued pursuant to this article to ensure a competitive market where no licensee is dominant. Now it's interesting. I think this is great language, but it's like recommend, you know, like what the, it's like not, no teeth there, but they can say, this is how much we recommend. And maybe if the recommendation is strong and what the executive director is doing is not, uh, there's opportunity for lobbying. Again, if it's clear what the board, what the recommend, uh, the advisory board is saying is different from what the executive director's office is doing. There's maybe opportunity for shift or pressure. Um, but yeah, really trying to make it so no licensee is dominant in a statewide mar marketplace or in any individual category of licensing to actively promote the potentially licensed social and economic equity applicants and carry out the goals of this chapter. I'm curious too, what that looks like if they determine, no, we, we went overboard and what, you know, there's a couple companies that are dominating. What do they do? Do they issue more licenses to be competitive? Do they pull back mm -hmm. on those licenses that they can they believe are too dominant like it's really interesting and they don't really address it in the law of what they would do um i don't even know right. if they would address that in the regulation uh but it, there is I mean, there is definitely some language that we've seen in this document that does it kind of seems like their first approach is to scale back the big company and it's like kind of like looking at uh uh, I think we'll, we'll probably see it maybe in this section, but I do recall them saying something along the lines of like, uh, it like really beginning to preface the language, like if a company has to scale back or they lose market share um, that, you know, maybe they wouldn't, I, th I think it had to do like the reapplication process, but I, there, it does seem more tailored to the bigger company getting scaled back. And that's interesting. I find this to be such an interesting clause because how do you regulate a like what is defined as doing well you know what i mean like yeah. like when you look about like when you think about like the difference between like how a company is doing in rochester versus how it's doing in new york city is going to be vastly different vastly like, won't even be able to to like compare the day of sales like something on fifth avenue in new york city versus like something on main street in buffalo is going to be very different you know so is it based on yearly sales? Is it, based, you know, even though they have probably way higher operating costs because their real estate is a hundred times higher than what it would be in a different. I just think that that's a very interesting uh, way to be able to govern that. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully it will be, it'll be in regulations or something along those lines as opposed to just kind of off the cuff how they feel about it. Yeah. Um, Jason, do you want to take this next section? Sure. All right. Limitations on licensure and duration. No license of any kind may be issued to a person under the age of 21 years, nor shall any licensee employ anyone under the age of 18. Any employee 18 years of age or older, but under 21 years of age may not have direct interaction with customers inside a licensed retail store. No licensee shall sell, deliver, or give away or cause to permit or permit or procure to be sold, delivered, or given away any cannabis or any cannabis product to any person actually or apparently under the age of 21 years or any visibly intoxicated person. So, you know, again, this always goes back to treat it kind of like, you know, alcohol, um, very similar to how a bar would be run. Uh, all right. It shall be an affirmative defense that such person had produced a photographic identification card apparently issued by a governmental entity and that the cannabis has been sold, delivered, or given to such person in reasonable reliance on such identification. In evaluating the applicability of such affirmative defense, the board should take into consideration any written policy or training adopted and implemented by the licensee to prevent sales to minors. 
no licensee or permittee shall knowingly sell, deliver, or give away, or cause or permit or procure to be sold, delivered, or given away to a lawful cannabis consumer any amount of cannabis which they know would cause the lawful cannabis consumer to be in violation of this chapter or possession limits established by Article 222 of the penal law. So don't can't sell them more than three ounces. <laughs> um, the board on the recommendation of the office shall have the authority to limit by canopy, plant count, square footage, or other means, the amount of cannabis allowed to be grown, possessed, distributed, or sold by a licensee. Um, that will be very interesting. That that one right there, when they actually come out with what those are, that'll answer so many questions for so many people. Yeah, that's uh, the biggest thing right there. All licenses under this article shall expire two years after the date of issue. Renewal. Each license issued pursuant to this article may be renewed upon application therefrom by the licensee and the payment of the fee for such license as prescribed by this article. In the case of applications for renewals, the board may dispense with the requirements of such statements as it deems unnecessary in view of those contained in the application made for the original license. But in any event, the submission of photographs of the license premises shall be dispensed with provided the applicant for such renewal shall file a statement with the board to the effect that there has been no alterations of such premises since the original license was issued. The board may make such rules as it deems necessary, not inconsistent with the chapter regarding applications for renewals of licenses and permits and the time for making the same. Each applicant must submit to the office documentation of racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of the applicant's employees and owners prior to a license being renewed. In addition, the board shall consult with the chief equity officer and executive director to create a social responsibility framework agreement that fosters racial, ethnic, and gender diversity in their workplace and makes and make the adherence to such agreement a conditional requirement of license renewal. That's wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an important paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, the board shall provide an application for renewal of the license issued under the board under this article, not less than 90 days prior to the expiration of the current license. The board may only issue a renewal license upon receipt of the prescribed renewal application and renewal fee from the licensee if, in addition to other criteria in this section, the licensee's license is not under suspension and has not been revoked. Each applicant must maintain a labor peace agreement with a bona fide labor organization that is actively engaged in representing or attempting to represent the applicant's employees and the maintenance of such a labor peace agreement shall be an ongoing material condition of licensure. Now, was this a change to this document? Because wasn't I, I? I feel like in the original proposals of the MRTA that it was for companies above twenty-five employees. I think you're right on that. They always had that labor peace agreement, but I think it was twenty-five and above, and now it's just anyone. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. the uh, unions are lobbying incredibly hard. Mm-hmm. They're hustling, especially each, for New York. Each applicant must provide evidence of the execution of their plan for benefiting communities and people disproportionately impacted by cannabis law enforcement required for the initial licensing pursuant to section 64 of this article. So um, it's, again, is it both, you know, social equity and non-social equity applicants? Is it just the non-social equity applicants? Um, you know, I'm on the side of, erring on the side of caution that everybody should probably just do this because it just makes your um, application stronger in general. All right, amendments, change in ownership and organizational structure. Licenses issued pursuant to this article shall specify the name address of the licensee, the activities permitted by the license, the land, buildings and facilities that may be used for the license activities of the licensee, a unique license number issued by the board, and such other information as the board shall deem necessary. Upon application of licensee of a licensee to the board, a license may be amended to allow the licensee to relocate within the state to add or delete licensed activities or facilities or to amend the ownership or organizational structure of the entity that is the licensee, the board shall establish a fee for such amendments. So that's, I mean, that's interesting too, that apparently you can add licensed activities. So if you want, if you're a cultivator and you want to add processing in the future, it's an amendment, not necessarily an entirely new application process, but that'll be interesting to see how, how that goes. Um, 
A license shall become void by any change in ownership, substantial corporate change or location without prior written approval of the board board may promulgate regulations allowing for certain types of changes in ownership without the need for prior approval. For purposes of this section, substantial corporate change shall mean for a corporation a change of 51% or more of the officers and or directors or a transfer of 51% or more of the stock of such corporation or an existing stockholder obtaining 51% or more of the stock of such corporation for an LLC. It's the same thing, but sub out officers, directors for managing members. Um, partnership, same thing. So basically, it, if something changes, we're over 51% change, there, you got to report it to the board and get their consent. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how readily available that consent will be or whether it's withheld. Um, I believe in hemp, the board or Department of Ag and Markets um, approved a lot of those transfers of licenses pretty readily. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, and I think it was a higher than that too. I think for hemp, it was like closer to like 70 or 80% change, which is yeah, pretty interesting. Um, okay. But to, also on that same note, you know, this conversation about folks buying up the existing processor license in New York State for hemp processors with the hope that they're, you know, it seems like with the hope of that then transitioning into the adult use. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to just be, you know, it's like, it is a substantial change. Um, but like, you know, should that person who just bought a license out from someone else in the hemp industry be grandfathered in to the adult use if they've only, owned, if they purchased that license in 2021, like, eh, not, not so sure. Yeah. It's like the same thing for people who are applying for a grow license right now for 500 bucks and then asking when they'd be grandfathered, you know? Yeah. Maybe yeah. I an actual infrastructure yeah yeah it's definitely it'll be interesting to see how ocm deals with those types of things because it doesn't seem like there's any way for them to give preferential treatment um for those license holders but you would more you kind of like tick the boxes for like you're able to comply and you have the proper facilities and things like that potentially mm -hmm. if you just mm -hmm. acquired it maybe not um but definitely interesting because I know that there's definitely a lot of people um, looking. I think the advantage when you're a hemp operator, especially a hemp operator that's not just doing it as a one-off, right? Like you have hemp operators who are growing, you know, a small batch of, of hemp as part of their large farming practices. And then you have actual hemp operators who are, you know, committed to the season in an expansive report and then processors, right? Like if you're a processor and you already have a GMP certification for hemp and your facility is all built out and, you know, we're talking about CBD extraction, like I think those people are going to be in really good spots, regardless of your, your uh, social equity status. You know, you're a person that could literally be up and running almost immediately once you're licensed. Um, other than the fact that you would have to, you know, get the product, the flower, um, and there would have to be some sort of probably mitigation in between those two components. But man, I just think that that's it's such an advantage to being a head processor that wants to switch over. Which is also, you know, an issue too, because they basically shut down those licenses like three years ago. So you either had to obtain one back in like 2018 or so or buy one out um, because they they really didn't have too many of those. Um, oh, what do you mean? Like, cause right now, like they're going through the process. Is that what you mean? The, the CBD processing licenses really haven't, you haven't been able to apply for those in quite some time. So. Oh no, they did a whole opening. They opened it all up in April. For, oh March. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. They, but the DOH, they've got manufacturing, they've got processing. Right, right, right. And all the people had to transfer over, you know, mm -hmm. if they have it up and running. Like so many people went for 2018 research partner agreements for processing, yeah. and never used them. Yeah. And then all those people who had them had to show that they were committed to it for the 2021 year to 2022 and could get GMP in a certain uh, time frame. But and they're awarding those now because the Department of Health, like I was talking with Patrick at the Department of Health, and he was not giving the licenses out for hemp operators who had applied in April until the rules were finalized. And obviously the rules were finalized last week, mm -hmm. a week and a half ago. So we'll start seeing those licenses roll in. Um, 
also the um, hemp cultivators are going to have to start complying with uh, USDA, USDA. Mm -hmm. which I think the end date, drop dead date from is uh, September 30th of this year. So mm -hmm. that's a whole other process because USDA is way more strict than New York's rules um, were and or are. Um, also, Elise, did you just say that the, the hemp regs were final, are finalized? Yeah, so they, they came out. Yeah, the they published them a week and a half ago, I think. So then it would be fair I gotta, to say- I got it sent by an email if you want me to forward it. Yeah, because really. it, then it would, it would be fair to say, right, that Delta 8 is, and Delta 10 as it were, are unequivocally illegal in New York right now like cannot be sold because it was effective upon, you know, the, the regulations um, becoming um, finalized. And if they're finalized, then then Delta 8 is is banned for all intents and purposes, which is. Yeah, it's interesting that there's um, a, apparently supposed to be a comment period, but I uh, the, like with folks I've spoken to with regards to the regs, it's like the regs are published um, but there's a room. They might change them, yeah, but they, they're They might change the them. The, yeah, which is because it has to go into like the, the New York State Register or something like that. That's when they become published. Or like, finalized. I'll say this DOH is considering them final because they were holding mm -hmm. on. Oh, sorry, my video's off. They were holding on like all of the, the, the licenses that were in queue who had like if you had a processing license and that i only know because of our clients right if you have a processing license back in the research partner agreement you went through a different path with doh than if you were just applying outright for a processing license and so they were holding those so they didn't have too much to change in their application to switch into the doh program but we kept asking them like one of these gonna get licensed one of these gonna get licensed because it was you know there wasn't that much had changed and we kept getting, well, it has to be when the final rules published, published, published and then now it's. They well, and I know it. if you go on the Department of Health's website, they basically say on there, you know, the regulations clarify our position that Delta 8 is illegal. So they're already saying it's illegal. They just, the regulations just make it explicit. So there's this, yeah, constant like, you know, is it legal? Is it not legal? And I think a lot of shop owners are caught in the middle. And then also the question is, are they going to enforce it? Which has always been, you know, an issue with hemp. Um, so oh, yeah, you're right. Whoever um, the comment was, you're right. I guess it is just pup. It is just revised. But I don't know why it must have changed for Department of Health because they're now starting to uh, change. You're right. I just checked my email. It is just proposed. I don't know why they changed out their cool. their points though on it. I'm wrong. My babe. Cool. That's why we're here. Um, does any, anyone want to take a swing at any of the, the Q&A? Um, there's a couple, um, you know, any update, who's going to be the, so, the fifth person on the board of the OCM? I don't even know who the first we four are personally. <laughs> we, no, there's no, I mean, I haven't heard of any updates for the board on OCM. Uh, they were supposed to meet this weekend, but I have a call later today to, to hear some updates, but I don't even know. Nobody's texted me. And they're supposed to, you know, they're supposed to be doing this before the end of session, which is the 10th, which is what, uh, a week from Thursday. So hypothetically, we should know in the next eight days, nine days, but we'll see. Um, so that one, the um, micro business, what would constitute a micro business limitations on site? Nope, um, that's probably not gonna be coming out until regulations, um, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the proposal from Senator Cooney is. So um, if anybody wants to <laughs> inform us. We're talking about the Senator Cooney proposal on the, uh, the temporary certification of, of MWBE businesses. I don't know. The question literally the just says, what are the prospects wrong. for this new proposal from Senator Cooney? Um, um, oh. Ask that person to follow up on that. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anonymous attendee, please follow up. Uh, also, put uh, your name because now I'm freaked out. <laughs> I'm just just uh, uh, and then, regarding the liquor like beer, wine, the liquor beer wine license, if you can obtain a license for on-site cannabis consumption, there doesn't seem to be any prohibition, but it can't be in the same place. Like it would just be two separate businesses, two separate locations. But you know, I don't believe that if you 
through one business hold an alcohol license, you are outright prohibited from holding a cannabis license. You just can't kind of mix and match things. Great, thanks guys. All right, so now we are where we've been waiting for, uh, the adult use license. Uh, so we're gonna start with number, section 68, adult use cultivated license. So let me just point um, out this, this numbers four and five were what I was talking about earlier when we first came on is these prohibitions. And you'll see as we go through them, how broad they actually are. Yep, love that. Um, so adult use cultivator license. An adult use cultivator's license shall authorize the acquisition, possession, distribution, cultivation, and sale of cannabis from the license premises of the adult use cultivator by such licensee to duly licensed processors in this state. The board may establish regulations allowing licensed adult use cultivators to perform certain types of minimal processing without the need for an adult use processor license. Uh, two, for the purpose of this section, cultivation shall include but not be limited to the agricultural production practices of planting, growing, cloning, harvesting, drying, curing, grading, and trimming of cannabis. And then Three, uh, a, process, a, a person holding an adult use cultivator's license may apply for and obtain one processor license and one distributor's license solely for the distribution of their own products. So I think that's important right there is that under the definition of adult use cultivator, they apparently can distribute to a processor. But if you want to distribute to retail, you have to get that distribution license, at which point you can only distribute your own product. Yeah. So you don't need to pay necessarily a third party to move it from cultivator to processing facility. But beyond that, you either need to get your license or hire somebody as a license. Yep. All right, so then number four, a person holding an adult use cultivator's license may, also, may not also hold a retail dispensary license pursuant to this article and no adult use cannabis cultivator shall have a direct or indirect interest including by stock ownership, interlocking directors, mortgage or lien, personal or real property, management agreements, share parent companies or affiliate organizations, or any other means in any premise licensed as an adult use cannabis retail dispensary or any business licensed as an adult use cannabis retail dispensary or in any registered organization registered pursuant to the article three of this chapter. So I think we can all so agree that that's ridiculously broad. Like, yeah. like, but here's my question. And this is really a you know, question about statutory construction is, so, okay, everything after including that you read, they listed everything. Does that apply to the next section? Because they have this indirect, direct interest, but they don't go through that laundry list. So, you know, my question is, is it the same for that they just didn't list it or did they really purposefully mean here are all the prohibitions when you're looking at a cultivator and a dispensary, but those aren't the same as if you're looking at a cultivator and having another interest in a cultivator license. Like it's, it's interesting why, or I don't understand why there are two different prohibitions when they're sort of similar, but one is more expansive than the other, but it's just a kind of list that's not in all inclusive. So now you're talking about number five, where it says no person may have a direct or indirect financial or controlling interest in more than one adult use cultivated license is issued pursuant to this chapter, provided that one adult use cultivated license may authorize adult use cultivation in more than one location pursuant to the criteria published by the board and regulation. So that just yeah. tells you that they're going to have an absolutely insane amount of, you're going to be able to have a huge, huge license though for grow. You're not going to need to. I don't think if you well, can but go more than one location, the cannabis. But if gonna... you're a uh, investor and you're investing in multiple things, like that's where I'm thinking of it is not necessarily the business owner who wants to get multiple licenses, but like an investor who wants to, you know, kind of invest in a variety of these things, you know, what that's, mm -hmm. that's where I'm kind of thinking about it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a big question because, I mean, folks who don't want to be plant touching, they are very interested in how to touch all the businesses, though. And it's, it's evident that that's going to be a very limited thing in the short term. Um, so from like raising capital to et cetera, you know, everyone has to do their diligence to ensure that investors are completely aware of these rules and regs as much as the business owners and operators are as well. 
Um, all right, so 68A, um, the registration, registered organization, adult use cultivator processor distribution retail dispensary license, AKA the RO license, the vertically integrated license. Uh, registered organization, cultivator processor distributor retail dispensary license shall have the same authorization conditions of adult use cultivator, adult use processor, adult use distributor, adult use retail dispensary license uh, issued pursuant to this article provided. However, the location of the adult use dispensary shall be limited to only three of the organizations, medical dispensaries, premises, facilities are authorized pursuant to article three in this chapter and that it may only distribute its own products. Um, and I'm curious, like may only distribute its own products, but does that mean it could have five different brands that are all white labeling at same products? So you got cookies in your medical dispensary because cookies, you know, gave the medical company one of their specific cuts, but the, the medical company grew it, but they're allowing for it to be branded differently. Does it have to be Columbia Care products only on shelf? You know, are there, um, think about the subsidiaries of those companies as well. Um, so like, yeah, curious how, when it comes to may only distribute its own products, what's, what qualifies as its own product? Well, and also remember too, that you're gonna have, if you start getting into more exotic arrangements and things like that, you're going to have this whole, the interplay between the restrictions on the licenses that you can't have you know, indirect or direct financial interest. So what if they're white labeling, but it's a percentage of revenue that they get, is that an indirect financial interest or maybe a direct financial interest? Like you get a lot of crossover and it's gonna be very difficult to kind of untangle that web without very, very good regulations. This is also the line that I was talking about last week, which is, is this, you know, the word distribute here is used in an interesting context because it sounds like direct to consumer as opposed to the distribution license. Maybe I'm reading it a little bit more vaguely than others, but you know, there's a school of thought that this indicates that they're only allowed to sell their own products. Um, and some are saying, no, this is just for the part of the distribution license. They can only sell and distribute themselves. Um, but there's a, a group out there that's that lobbying and saying, no, this is for medical marijuana. They're only allowed to do their own products in their own stores, which is what they do now, right? They only distribute their own products right now and they sell their own products. So be curious to see what uh, comes out of this. Hmm. Yeah, I think that these two, this 68A and the next one, 68B, are, are very interesting provisions that are going to really govern, um, you know, the bigger side of cannabis, I think, at first, uh, you know, fully vertically integrated adult use licenses. Mm -hmm. So the, the, just the end of this, sent, this, chat, this paragraph is provided further that such registered organization shall maintain its medical cannabis license to continue offering medical cannabis to a degree established by regulation of the board. Such license does not qualify such organization for any other adult use license. So it's, it's, if you're going to do, do this RO, you also have to do medical cannabis. I'd be curious if the board will scale back how much they actually have to do medical. Is it 10% of their production? Is it, a, is it 50%? Is it 80% of their production has to be uh, maintained as medical? Like that'd be interesting. Um, all right, so then two, a person holding an RO, adult use cultivator, processor, distributor, retail dispensary license may not also hold another retail dispensary license pursuant to this article. And no registered organization, adult use cultivator, processor, distributor, retail dispensary shall have a direct or indirect interest, including stock ownership, et cetera, um, affiliated with by any means and license uh, on a pr any premise license as an adult use cannabis retail dispensary or in any business license as an adult use cannabis dispensary. So again, just being explicit that there's no overlap in other dispensaries there. Dispensaries, but, uh, it, but it's interesting that they limit it to dispensaries, not cultivators. So maybe what you were talking about where like they're white labeling, maybe they're allowing that, you know, not explicitly, but it's, you know, not prohibited. But that's what they're doing all right now, right? They all white label with PharmaCan's product. That's what almost... Mm -hmm. Like of the 10 ROs, I think seven of them do that with PharmaCans. There's only like 300,000 square feet of flower right now for all 10 ROs. It's super tiny. It's not a lot. And they all, PharmaCans, the one who's been just absolutely crushing on it. They've all just been using their white label. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. And so again, like 
what's their own products? Like, does that, is that, is that anyone else's own product? I'd say it's not, um, but is it, they buy it and then they put it in their own bag and sell it into their own product. Like, you know, what's the fine print on those regs? And then yeah, can we see that? Do we see that elsewhere in this bill as well? I want for other, other licensees. Um, yeah, and will that practice be able to be maintained? You know, maybe existing regs, it was allowed, but under this new bill, if you read it, if you read, you know, uh, own like very critically, you know, narrowly with your own products and like, yeah, I don't think you could ever argue that someone else's grow is your own um, unless we say that it is okay to put it in a bag and then call it your own. So we'll see. Um, oh, there's a few questions in the Q and A. Um, let's take a moment here. Um, oh, answering that done. So from Roy it says California micro businesses limit is 10,000 square foot. New Jersey's 2,500. What will they the limits most likely be for micro? Um, who knows? I've heard up to 10. You know, I've heard. At, they're asking for 10, but like, you know, knowing that, that the state was proposing something like 25. So like maybe meeting in the middle. It's, it's not helpful at all, but you could probably be sure it's going to be somewhere between a thousand and 10,000. Like that doesn't <laughs> yeah. help, but that's probably the range. <laughs> yeah. I also think 10,000 is going to be incredibly high. I would say closer to one to five. Yeah. And yeah, great question, Roy. With white labeling, who pays the cultivation tax? So um, if, if that, if you mean the X, the THC excise tax, that's paid by the retailer to the distributor or distributor license holder. Um, so mm -hmm. basically everything kind of happens at retail. The excise taxes are paid by the retailer. The sales taxes are paid by the consumer and collected by the retailer. Everybody upstream, presumably the way I read the law does not have to deal with the collection of taxes from New York, except for the distributor they collected. Mm. Yeah, appreciate that. All right, cool. Let us continue them. 68B, registered or, um, organization, adult use cultivator, processor and distributor license. Uh, so an RO cultivator, processor and distributor license shall have the same authorization conditions as an adult use cultivator, processor, distributor license provided. However, that such license does not qualify such organization for any other adult use license and may only authorize the distribution of the licensee's own product. So how is that different than the previous paragraph? Anyone have <laughs> thoughts on that? Like how is 68B different than 68A? I'm not so sure. Um, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling so much here. So it's interesting because 68A is RO, adult use, cultivator, processor, distributor, retail, dispensary. 68B is registered adult use, cultivator, processor, and distributor. So it's, they, they knocked off the dispensary at the end. So there's two variations there apparently of the, the RO license. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting that they could be fully vertically integrated except for retail, which is literally like the biggest prohibition in the vertical integration side of things on adult use. So I don't really know. Yeah, maybe again, it's purely for people for medical interest, but this is for adult use, so it's not. Um, and maybe, I'm not sure if, are there any other, are there any ROs in New York State who are currently operating without doing a dispensary? You know, you said the Pharmacan, I imagine they have a dispensary as well, but they, you know, maybe yeah, they, they have are four. doing. Yeah, the only so ones, they, there's, yeah. the only ones are that there's three that, or not three, there's some that only have three dispensaries and they haven't up got, they haven't up and running their fourth yet. But for the most part, they have, every single RO has at least three dispensaries. Yeah, it's so interesting. So who knows, but they definitely took out retail out of 68B. Well, so you want to know what might be interesting. They might have done this because say the medical doesn't opt in. Right, like say the medical ROs decide not to do that competitive bidding process. They want to keep their existing ones. Um, they might not have any additional because if they have four new dispensaries, two of them have to be in underserved areas. Mm -hmm. First two, so five and six have to be in, in underserved areas. And so they might just say, "Hey, you know, we're not going to get into that," but they might be still be able to 
um, they might still apply for a cultivator's license at, they might not be vertically integrated. They might just apply for a cultivator's license. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it could be that. And they could just yeah. not have a competitive bidding process, which is going to be a lot of money. True. Um, Nick, I appreciate your comments here. Um, Nick saying the excise tax is collected at the distribution level and the 13% is at the retail level. Um, I can't fact check you off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm just happy to get feedback. And that's, I think we're- That's correct. And that's what I had said is collected by the dis oh, distributor cool. or the retailer, if it's the sales tax, the nine per 13%, sorry. Got it. Great, cool. Well, thanks for the confirmation, both of you guys. Um, all right, on to the adult use processor license. Um, adult use processor license shall authorize the acquisition, possession, processing, and sale of cannabis from the licensed premises of the adult use cultivator by such a licensee to a duly licensed processor or distributors. A person holding an adult use processor's license may apply for and obtain one distributor's license solely for the distribution of their own products. For the purpose of this section, processor, um, for the purpose of the section, processor shall include but not be limited to blending, extracting, infusing, packaging, labeling, branding, or, and otherwise making or preparing cannabis products. Processing shall not shall not include the cultivation of cannabis. So I think we had gotten a question about something about packaging at one point, maybe where, you know, if they were just packaging things, do they have to obtain a license? Yes. Um, if you were just packaging, you need to be, have a processor license. Yep. According to this. Yep. And then uh, no processor shall be engaged in any other business on the premise to be licensed, except that a person issued adult use cannabis cultivator processor or distributed license may hold and operate all issued license at the same process. So if you at the same uh, premises. So if you if you personally get your your extra, your cultivator, processor, or distributor, great. You can all work under one roof. But if not, it sounds like it's got to be in separate spaces. Um, so for no cannabis processor licensee may hold then more than one cannabis processor license, provided a single license may have authorized processor activities at multiple locations uh, set out. Oops, I'm going to do that. And then no adult use cannabis processor shall have a direct or indirect interest. Um, and here we go again on the adult use dispensary or any location that's permitted as for adult use dispensary. Um, or in any uh, RO. So basically if you got your adult use license, you can't, or if you got your processor license, you cannot have any interest in anything connected to a dispensary or a, a registered organization. And six, adult use processor licenses are subject to a minimum operating requirements and determined by the board. What do y'all think minimum operating requirement means in this case? Hmm. I don't know if that's like if they are tiering out these licenses and say, you know, you have to hit the minimum of the tier or something, or you have to just be what is going to be, you know, CGMP. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. And Roy, to answer your question, as I read it, and I, it's a little bit peeving um, to see, is that trimming is considered cultivation, um, which is fine. It's good for, you know, a, a, an in-house group to be able to do that. But it's interesting. What if you wanted to be a processor and part of the, like, the thing you want to do is trim? Not everyone wants to buy the trim off of, you know, something finished trim off of a uh, a dis off of a, a cultivator or not every cultivator wants to be a, a, pro, um, a trimmer. So I think that there's, there's definitely some question there as like, where does trimming find, like, will the regs allow for trimming in both cultivation and processing? Um, I would imagine so, um, or at least hope so. Um, all right, well, let's just take maybe a quick swing at the adult use cooperative license of section 70 because and then we'll probably wrap things up. Um, so the adult use cooperative license, uh, one, a, a cooperative license shall authorize the acquisition, possession, cultivation, processing and distribution and sale from the license premises of the adult use cooperative by such licensee to a duly licensed distributors on site consumption sites. Uh, registered organizations and or retail dispensaries, but not directly to cannabis consumers. 
So essentially this, uh, you know, a cooperative can do everything but be a retailer, um, which is interesting. Um, to be a license, to be licensed as an adult use cooperative, the cooperative must one be, or A, be compromised, comprised of residents of the state of New York as a limited liability company or a limited liability partnership under the laws of the state or an appropriate business structure as determined and authorized by the board. Uh, B, subordinate capital, both as regards control over the cooperative undertaking and as regards to the ownership of the pecuniary, how do you pronounce that? Pecuniary. Pecuniary benefits arising therefrom. C, be demo, oh, ah, uh, yeah. Uh, be democratically controlled by the members themselves on the basis of one vote per member. Uh, vest in and allocate with priority to and among the members all the increases arising from the cooperative endeavor in proportion to the members active participation in the cooperative endeavor. And E, the cooperative must operate according to the seven cooperative principles published by the International Cooperative Alliance in 1995. Um, a cooperative member shall be a natural person and shall not be a member of more than one adult use cooperative license pursuant to this section. No natural person or member of an adult use cooperative license may have a direct or indirect financial or controlling interest in any other adult use cannabis license issued pursuant to this chapter. And no adult use cannabis cooperative shall have a direct or indirect interest, including stock ownership, et cetera, on a cannabis uh, retail dispensary. The board shall promulgate regulations governing cooperative license, including but not limited to the established canopy limits and the size and scope of cooperative license and, and other measures designed to incentivize the use of a licensed cooperative. So um, I just want to point out one thing that I find interesting, and this kind of relates to all the different licenses, is apparently the legislature believes that there is a difference between indirect financial or controlling interest and indirect or direct interest. Like, they keep going back and forth between these two concepts. I honestly don't know if I can figure out what an actual difference is because if you have an indirect financial, direct or indirect financial interest, I'm not sure how that's not covered by, like, I, I don't know. I, I, but I do think it's interesting. Like they are drawing this distinction. I'm just not sure exactly what the distinction is. Hmm. Yeah, and I think again, we talked last week a little bit about um, on site consumption allowance. And I'm, uh, I think it's a point that we'll get into next week. So everyone make sure you stay tuned. But, um, you know, a cooperative can sell their flour to an on site consumption lounge. And on site consumption lounges, as I interpret it, they can sell flour, but it has to be, it's going to be limited. They can sell products, but that are limited amounts. And they can only hold a certain amount of inventory in limited amounts designated by the regs. Think um, and I'm, basically bar versus liquor store. Like that's how I believe an on-site consumption yeah. lounge is, is it's a bar for cannabis. So, you know, you're not, yeah, you're, be not you're not out walking out. Ounces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's just, it's a, it's a fun thing to follow up on. And we'll definitely dive into that next week. Um, I'm going to stop the share. Are there any other questions as we wrap up today's workshop? I'm always interested in hearing people's thoughts on the consumption licenses because I hear people kind of bringing it up every now and again. But on the other hand, you know, there are definitely other states that authorize on-site consumption, yet you don't find these lounges nearly at as many places as you do a bars or B dispensaries. So the question is, you know, why? And that's, I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. Well, I mean, if we're looking at it, there's a lot of states that didn't open it up. And it was actually like Oregon in, in its early launch, it was a big on-site consumption was a huge thing. And then it got squashed. And I think that um, honestly, a lot of the kind of inner level speakings I hear is that like, you know, moving towards on-site consumption and like the experience around cannabis is going to be a huge market when there's massive market domination by MSOs, you know? So the like for small businesses moving in that direction, like on-site consumption and experience, cannabis experience may be a, a, a huge opportunity for small business in the future where it seem, it could seem grim if you're looking going head to head or toe to toe with, you know, some large entities. Um, but I do think it's that, yeah, there's definitely been, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Zach. I was just going to say 2019 Colorado passed theirs and they didn't really get them implemented and up and running until probably they'll start seeing them this year because 2020 was a bust 
And so you'll see them being a little bit more common in some of these adult use states, I think, probably this coming year. I know yeah, they're I authorized agree. in California too. Like I think there's one in LA, maybe there's more, but the last I knew there was like one. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, it in theory, it comes back down to jurisdiction too. Like too yeah, I think, again, this is a clear example where we still see a lot of stigma around cannabis. It's mm -hmm. like, it's a criminal thing. It's dangerous. It's bad. People are going to die. It's going to, you know, make our roads more dangerous. And it's like, you know, there's still so much overhead to like, you know, on a municipal level, like where, like how much, going back to California, the example, like maybe there's a handful of consumption lounges in this massive state, but like, like I don't know if it's 50% plus of the state has opted out of cannabis. Um, so you begin to look at like still on a granular level, how, uh, how, how controlling the zoning and everything can be. And it's for this infant thing that people are still scared of, like, okay, they allowed consumption because they, they want to divert from the, the, the illicit market. They want to capture tax revenue, but they're still, people are still afraid to, uh, uh to kind of allow for that, that next thing. So, all right. Um, it is time to Shift. I've got one more comment from Nick. It's going to be tough to manage on-site consumption lounges since they can't be involved in any other license. Um, having to simply buy and sell products might be tougher to establish a brand. Yeah, I think that's a big thing, and it's probably. Um, well, that's I would not, imagine I mean, that's, on. That's no different than dispensary, though. I mean, it's you know. I think that retail has a harder end because they got to draw in the customers as opposed to like you know they just trade on their own brand. Yep. Um, and then there's just a couple more questions. Any Anything in the MRTA regarding one day events that include sales and consumption? Um, no, but they, we've seen that with the, um, I think there is gonna be special permitting. I'm actually positive there will be. Um, we've seen that even for like, they added for uh, the hemp extract bill allowing for special use permitting specifically for farmers markets, et cetera. But, um, I'm sure, you know, if you're going to have a, a cannabis based festival, like they're going to allow for on site consumption at that facility in a, a narrow window of time, get special permitting, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think that'll definitely be a thing. Yeah. Rule of thumb is, you know, we've kind of been operating on is if we don't know the answer, then the alcohol law might provide a little bit of insight. And the alcohol law absolutely has those types of special use permits and things like that. So I don't think it would be a stretch to say that that's probably going to come out through regulation. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, again, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsoring members, our founding sponsor, Harris Beach Law Firm, as well as uh, our 2021 sponsoring members, Mad Hatter's Hideaway and the Wagner Firm, PLLC. Um, big, out, big shout out to everyone who is on this call and big thanks to everyone who's watched, who has not, but is checking out this recording. Uh, we will see you again next week as we continue to cruise through the MRTA through this uh, New York Legalization Workshop Series hosted and presented by Hemp Lab. Jason, thank you so much for being here. We'll thank see you. you next week and take care folks, bye-bye.